Welcome to Vancouver Business Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I am Roger Killen, the organizer. This evening, Alain Bailey is training us on how to discover our path from imposter syndrome to authentic leader. Alain, welcome. Thank is you, it, Roger. Is it okay if I ask you a couple of get to know you questions? Absolutely. All right, the first one is super easy. What makes you tick? What fuels you? What mm. drives you? Yeah, and it, this has become even more relevant now and it'll make even more sense when I share a bit of my story. Um, I'm fueled by uh, exactly what's happening in the world right now, as, as depressing as it might seem. Um, I understand or I interpret this moment as a transformative moment, as a moment where more and more people wake up. So I am fueled by being able to participate in what's happening in the world and to be of service uh, in, in the current time. Mm, okay, that's very noble. Thank you. <laughs> the world needs more people like you. Uh, speaking of these times, uh, what do you make of them? Yeah, it's, uh, again, I'll share more of this in my story in a moment. Um, I, maybe like many other people, had uh, an experience of grief, had an experience, and, you know, I haven't personally been impacted by COVID um, directly in terms of my health. Uh, but in terms of what's going on in the world, whether it's COVID, race relations, politics, um, it's all, it all feels very significant. And yet I notice that I come alive in crisis and I feel resilient and, and highly motivated to, to be a contribution. So I, I do think that this is an important time. And I, I refer to it as a moment not to diminish what we're all experiencing, but in, in the line of history, it is a moment. Uh, I think it's a very significant moment. And, you know, I always wondered when I was in, in high school, it's like, who wrote the history books and how did they know? When did they know that what they were experiencing was significant? Was it after the fact? Was it years after the fact? When you look back and you see how all the dots connected, uh, well, I'm in it like a fish in water, just like everybody else. And I, I know how significant it is. So. Well, that's quite an introduction to your talk. Uh, audience, when you have a question, please type it into the chat. And periodically through Alain's talk, I'll interrupt her and pose your questions. Uh, the, uh, the, the video recording of Alain's talk will be made public, uh, certainly no later than noon tomorrow and maybe a lot sooner, uh, depending on how tired I feel later. Uh, Alain, are you ready to rock the stage? I was born ready, Roger. Then you, <laughs> then you take it away and show us how it's done. Awesome. So uh, I want to um, share a little bit of my story because, you know, training, it's nice. You can show up and tell others what to do. I think if you have the context of the, the experiences I've had, it'll make more sense and it'll feel perhaps more genuine and authentic that I've been there. So um, I just want to give you a little recap of the long and winding road that has been my life over the last four years. I won't go back too far, just four years. Um, I'll start though with January, 2020. And for me, I have this ritual that I do at the beginning of every year where I just get quiet, I get still, and I zone in, you know, to, I call it my inner guidance system or my inner GPS. And I'm listening for what does the year have in store? And this year, the message was clear. It was a message <clears throat> of big energy. And I didn't know what that meant. Uh, by the way, uh, when I picked 143 as the number earlier, Simon told me what 143 meant. So you just never know <laughs> what messages are hidden in what you think is just a, an ordinary uh, comment. So big energy was uh, the message that I got earlier in the year. And for me, that was sort of like, oh yeah, you know, four years earlier, 2016 had been a big year for me. I had been sort of languishing in a contract with a company where I felt undervalued. I didn't feel seen, I didn't feel visible. And I just decided, first of all, I felt stuck for a very long time. And then I decided to take my life into my own hands. And back in 2016, I started making changes. I, 
changed my birth name to reflect the passion. You know, Elan means passion and ardor. So I chose a name. I got my teeth fixed. I had had crooked teeth. You would never see any pictures of me smiling. And my son at that point was about, uh, well, he would have been about 14 years old. I didn't have any pictures with me smiling with my son. Um, I lost 50 pounds. Roger, there with you. I know how challenging it can be. I mean, I really just took my life into my hands. And, you know, I have this saying that you are the, the author, director, and lead actor of your own life. Well, 2016 was a year like that for me. And I went from being a solopreneur to getting offered. I mean, the job wasn't even posted anywhere. I got offered a job as a director in a software company. And it was really, by all definitions, my dream job at the time. But it wasn't very long, probably about six months of being back in the corporate world where I started to feel that like, ooh, you know, that feeling where you got to take all of who you are and kind of fit it down into the container. So, you know, I talk about imposter syndrome. That was one experience of imposter syndrome where you take all of your potential and greatness and you try to fit it into a particular container because that's the rules of that game. Uh, but I had a great experience. I worked with that company for 16 months. 16 months later, though, I got the nod that, you know, they had were tight on cash and I was expendable. So I'd gone from the high now down to the low, watch my dream, you know, shatter. Um, but I had gotten a taste while I was working for that organization of work that I'm deeply passionate about, which was people development. And I had never really done it in that context before. So I had invested a lot in building up, not just the professional side of my team members, but their personal development as well. So it kind of gave me a taste. So here I am, I'm unemployed, I'm back out into the world and I'm thinking about what's next. Well, I made a shift and I decided that this people development thing was my passion. And I threw my hat over the wall that this was something that I was going to do full time. And it didn't take long. It was about four months. I landed a contract with an organization. And now I had the opportunity to take hundreds of employees through this authentic leadership process to really have them understand themselves and bring their best selves to work and be able to navigate better some of the challenges of, of being on the job. Uh, it was incredible to be able to express that part of myself, right? So now the roller coaster is back up at the top and I'm feeling that like, yes, this is, this is the juice. Um, but I'm a little bit more wary, right? And, and I'm a little bit more aware all along that I'm in a container and it's somebody else's container. Somebody else's vision is guiding the boat. So as is often the case in startup life, it was not surprising six months later, I forget who it was. Was it Melissa who said she'd been laid off twice in three years? So six months later for me, Melissa, uh, you know, funds are low and you're expendable. So I went through that dip in the roller coaster ride again. One more time though, I had this experience of like, I got a taste of my vision. I got to express some of who I am and some of my greater potential, but not quite all of it. Okay. So, so far imposter syndrome for me has been, you know, taking the bigness and fitting it into a smaller container. About six weeks later, I have the opportunity, a recruiter approaches me and I have the opportunity to join a US consulting firm. And this time I'm really hesitant. I'm like, okay. Now, to be honest, I'm making decisions from a different place. I'm not making decisions from my passion and am I gonna get to do people development and what's my impact in the world. Now I'm straight up making decisions from survival. Okay, this has enough of my check boxes to be able to do this kind of work and pay the bills. And you know what? I've kind of hit, hit the bottom of the roller coaster a couple of times over the last four years. So I deserve to earn more. So I'm really going to go for it. And what I did was I shifted the deck of my values and I put things like um, my financial income and financial return higher up on the list than I'd ever put them on the list before but I did it by kind of shuffling some of my other values lower, right? So I take on this opportunity. I have the opportunity to try this out, but I'm hesitant and I'm nervous. And for the first time in my life, I have this sinking feeling in my gut that I've made a mistake. 
So I have the opportunity to travel and go do some training. And I meet some wonderful people on my first day of training. But I'm like, oh, holy, I, I think I'm in the wrong room. These guys are all performance driven. They've got a long list of achievements, big businesses that they've run, which that was part of the criteria. You know, you'd been an entrepreneur and I'm like, I've had some success, but it, but it doesn't compare to what these guys have done. And I just, you know, three days later, my anxiety was so far through the roof. So now I'm having a different experience of imposter syndrome. Now I feel like I'm in the wrong room and I don't belong, not because I have to fit myself, make myself smaller to fit, but I don't feel big enough. I don't feel like I've accomplished enough to belong here and to, to meet the expectations of the role. So fast forward, here we come, January, 2020. By this time now, this is you know five months into the role. I get this message about big energy and I'm excited. Cause I'm like time to right the wrongs. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to figure this out. Uh, you know, I've been kind of just a little bit nervous and that imposter syndrome has had me back on the sidelines and not fully giving myself to what I'm doing here. I know enough about how to bring out the best in people. Like part of what I was doing in the last four years was, was helping people be happy, healthy, and high performing. So certainly I can apply that to myself. Right. So big energy, I take that message and I'm like, here we go. So what do I do? I write a whole strategic plan around how I am going to bring that big energy into my current role. And I realize in that moment that I don't have to choose between my passion and a paycheck. I can do both. So as I said, I write out the strategic plan. This was January. And then uh, for those of you that might know or don't know in Canada, our year started off with a total shutdown of our economic, our transportation system. There was this conflict happening about indigenous lands. And that was the biggest disruption I'd ever seen to the Canadian economy. That was January. And then we had March when that's, I think it was probably similar for a lot of people around the world. March was when the lockdown first happened and people started working from home. By April, I'm like, okay, it's been a rough go. I haven't been performing to the standard that, that this employer would expect of me. But when things start to lock down, I'm thinking maybe there'll be some relief. And maybe I can just, you know, all none of this is going according to plan. So maybe we can just take it down a notch and that'll give me some reprieve and I can reset. Well, by April, I find myself at 50 years old for the first time ever on a performance improvement plan. How did I get here? How did I go from being the person who was contracted to take hundreds of employees through and have them be their best selves at work? I'm the person you hire to have a happy, healthy, high-performing teams. And now here I am stressed out, miserable, and on a performance improvement plan. I'm underperforming, right? Like nobody's winning here. <laughs> so for me, it was this like, first of all, to be honest, my first thought was big energy. Are you kidding me? Like, was this a cosmic joke? Is that what big energy meant? Like, could, did I get it so wrong? And I went through a whole process, like maybe many of you, where I was grieving my plans. This was going to be my year, not just any old year. And I was grieving the loss of like, this is totally beyond my control and there's no way to get it back. But I think something about that being put on the plan was like a wake up call. Okay, I've tried everything. I've thrown the kitchen sink at this. I've asked for help, I've reached out, I've tried all these different strategies, nothing is working. I'm like Sisyphus pushing the rock up the hill and the thing just keeps sliding back down on me. So I took coronavirus, not as a barrier to my vision, but actually a catalyst. And it was the thing that woke me up. The vision I've had, I've actually had for 20 years. I've seen so clearly what my role is to play. 
in helping others. And I wouldn't allow myself to step into that. So I want to share with you some of the missteps along the way. And I'll just say, none of these were mistakes. Everything can serve your journey. I have no regrets. But it's incredible to just be able to pause and take that introspection and to look at the places where I made choices that weren't about my authentic self, choices that were made from fear and survival, and those take me down a different path. So I'll share five or six of these highlights with you. One was to let others or circumstances define my value. So even back to before 2016, and I mentioned I'd had this contract working with a company for six, seven years, and I felt stuck. I felt so small and I knew what I had to offer, but no one there that was making the leadership decisions was willing to value those things. And so I let myself become defined by the value that others were seeing or not seeing in me. Okay. So that was one of my missteps. Secondly, and this was a big one for me. And that was, I took a message that came from my intuition and turned it into a strategic plan. Those are two very different things. And we tend to rely a lot on strategy and tactics. And it's what gets celebrated in business. As a matter of fact, people will say intuition, that's that woo-woo stuff. <laughs> I actually don't use the word woo-woo. It's part of our humanity. It's part of how we are born. It's part of our makeup. And guess what? It is where your potential lies. And some of the things that you're out to create and some of the impacts that you're out to create don't get created with a to-do list. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a second. The other misstep I took was trying to go it alone. I'd been this, I built my reputation as the solopreneur. I was quite frankly, the get shit done woman. I, you give me a project, a venture, you know, I've got ideas, I've got plans, I've got strategies, let's get it done. Uh, but there comes a time when trying to do it all yourself actually is a limitation. So that was one of my missteps putting my vision on the back burner to fit the economic container. So this is where I shuffled my deck. And I was like, you know what? My vision can wait. For now, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. And again, no regrets, but I can see how when I make those choices from fear, how it gets me into trouble. Also, not challenging my own script. So I'll talk a little bit more about this. Acting like an extra. Acting like I am a victim of circumstances. I don't have any control. I'm a mom. I'm a single mom. I'm a woman over 50. I'm a black woman. Like I can tick all the boxes of reasons I could be marginalized in society. And for the most part, I don't live my life that way. But anytime things go off the rails is when I start to go into that mindset and stay there. And I forget that I am the one writing the script. So as a result, I end up, ended up losing myself in the process. So right, trying, to hard, trying hard to fit in to meet uh, expectations. So I wanna talk about authenticity for a second because it is the core, you know, for me, it's that discovering the path from imposter to authentic leader. And I talk to women in particular, but men I know experience this as well. I talk to a lot of people about imposter syndrome. And there's times when we become collapsed with it, like as if that's who we are. And so to me, the opposite of imposter is you as your authentic self. Somebody I was, had a mentor on the weekend I was listening to who said, you know, we're only born with two fears. And I'm going to forget the second one. One of them is falling. Does anybody know the second one? Babies only have, oh, loud noises. Fear and loud noises. Those are the only two things babies are afraid of. 
And the rest of it, we pick up over our lifetime through our stories, our experiences first become interpretations, become assumptions, become beliefs, become stories that become an identity. And for me, this work is so important because this is what we're seeing in the world today. You can't write a strategic plan to get us out of what we've created in terms of our relations with each other. Elan, could you repeat the two fears? Because you said that one of them was fear. The two fears are falling and loud noises. Yeah. Thank Those you. Are the, the only two authentic fears. So to me, being our authentic self is the, is the antithesis of leading our lives from a place of survival. Okay, so I, I just had to do a little bit of exploration on this and the word authentic, there's two words. There's, there's author, authorship, authority, and those all have the same root, which is from the Latin octor, which is master or leader, founder, literally one who causes to grow. And then authentic originates from authenticos, the ancient, ancient Greece word, and that is one acting on its own authority. So this is the place where we're not supported from an early age to act on our own authority. We very subtly pick up the habit of looking to the front of the room for the right answer. Did I get it right? Did she call on me? Did he call on me? We look to our parents, we look to our peer groups. And then suddenly we're 60 and we're still looking externally for that validation. So the work I do is around helping us get back to our authentic self so that we can hear that inner GPS and use that not to throw out the strategic plan altogether, but to use them in balance, to use them in harmony, to move ourselves forward. Um, you may have seen the reaction I had when Care talked about her commitment over the next 12 months. Now, I have a personal relationship with Karen. I haven't seen her in a very long time. But I remember having a conversation with her and her sharing something that she was deeply passionate about. And when she started to speak tonight, she said, well, it's a personal goal. And I thought, I wonder if she'll be vulnerable and share it. And so I was super excited to hear Many of us, our 12 month commitment is like, well, I'm going to grow my business. I'm going to make more money. I'm going to, that's all great. There's no judgment here. Those are all worthy, valid goals. But what I'm talking about is we don't know, like if anything has woken me up this year is we don't know that tomorrow is guaranteed. It never was, but that's more real and up close now than it ever has been. And so for me, the journey from imposter to authentic leader, and I'll get back to what happened in that story in a second, but that journey was like, hell no, I am not going to my grave with my song unsung. I have done this dance for too long now, and I have convinced myself that I can't live my vision because I don't have enough time. I don't have enough resources. I don't have enough know-how. I don't have enough money, right? When I lose the weight, when my son moves out of the house, when I'm a certain, age, you know, I, I'm sure you've done the when and the when if or the what if dance. So coronavirus really snapped me out of it. And then when it was coronavirus and then the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and all of those things started to stack on top of each other. And I was like, this is everything that I've been training for. This is everything that I have committed my life to do. And if this isn't the time when I step forward and lead and help others lead from their authentic self, if this isn't the best time, then there is no other time. So I wanna talk a little bit and I apologize for the slide. I know it's, it's not in the best shape, but I just wanna talk a little bit about how I define authentic leadership. And Roger, you'll, you'll keep me on track if I'm going on too long and then we'll take questions. Okay, why don't I do that? I'll just define authentic leadership and then we'll pause for questions. Is that okay? Sounds great. Perfect. So I, I heard somebody the other day already start to, you know how we use words and they become all familiar and we're like, yeah, I don't think that it's, they're no longer 
they become a fad and then they're no longer fad worthy and we throw them out and we throw out all the richness of the meaning at the same time. Now, I know language is limited. It never quite expresses all of the magnificence of our humanity. But I'm gonna reclaim a couple of words that we overuse. One is power and one is love. And these aren't my definitions. They come from a gentleman by the name of Paul Tillich, who was a theologian. And Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. studied under him and also picked up on power and love. So power is the drive to self-realize. I've got a mission, I've got an impact, I'm committed to something. And I don't need to apologize for that. <laughs> Unapologetically, you are here in this world to do something, maybe many somethings. Okay, that's the drive to self-realize. On the other side is love. Again, another highly misused and abused term. But the way Paul Tillich defined it is love is the drive for unity and connection. So here's how I define authentic leadership is bringing those two things together. So it's okay for me to make money. I'm not gonna apologize about that. It's okay for me to make an impact in the world, but not at the expense of my connections, not at the expense of the planet, right? Or where women, or where a lot of us women go is we are all about service and nurturing and taking care of others at the expense of ourselves or we put our vision on hold, we put what we care about on hold, and we focus on taking care of others. Now, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, created a quote or had a quote around this. And he says, power without love is reckless and abusive. And love without power is sentimental and anemic. So I'm gonna pause there and then we'll come back and we'll talk about, well, what the hell does that have to do with running a business? <laughs> Elan, I'm afraid I only have one question for you. Awesome. And that question is from Chris Brody, who wants to be reminded about what your ask was when we did. I didn't have one. <laughs> uh, you didn't have one. Do you have one now that you care to share with us? I, I don't. I think my talk is my ask. And my ask is really that you live your life to the fullest, that oh. you don't put off till tomorrow. Uh, something that isn't guaranteed you'll ever get to do. So my ask, let me put a finer point on that. Go back to what you said you wanted to commit to in the next 12 months and take another look. If tomorrow was the day when you looked back at your life, would it be, would the thing that you wrote down or said tonight, would that be at the top of your list? Would it even be top three? And if it's not top three, I'd reevaluate. No judgment, but just maybe look again. Uh, for, for myself, it would not even appear in the top five. Thank you for that nudge. Uh, and there are no further questions. So carry on with your presentation. We shall commence. Perfect timing. We are going to set our compass. So here's the deal. This, there's nothing wrong with the way that we live our lives. So if anybody's still here with an idea that there's something wrong or something that needs to be fixed, or if only you'd gone in this direction versus that direction, none of that matters. All that matters is what we create out of it, the meaning that we give it and how we then use what we've learned to take ourselves forward. So in many of those moments, the decisions I was making were about survival, right? I ha I'm, a, I'm a mom who has raised my son on my own from day one. And there have been many times where I made decisions to put entrepreneurship ahead of getting a job and it impacted us directly. Come home, I'm not sure how I'm gonna put food in the fridge tonight. Like I've lived those experiences. I've never been homeless, never been out on the street, but we've had some hard times based on choices I made. Okay. So survival comes up, that fear comes up, and sometimes it's the thing driving the bus and we don't even know it. So what I do is I create a practice around creating an, an alternative. They say nature abhors a vacuum. So if you have survival instincts that have been guiding your choices and your decision-making, they will continue to drive unless you become aware of them, challenge them, shake them up, disrupt them, and replace them with something that orients you 
to something that is more fulfilling. So this is where we get to create our compass. So I would encourage you to, and I don't remember what my next slide is. Okay. So why don't we do this and make it interactive? Because I've been talking at you. So I'm going to ask you, and you might get a second shot at that question now, <laughs> I just realized. So if you have a pen and paper handy, or maybe you have your digital device, I would really love if you would take a pause and answer these questions. What's the impact you're here to make? So part of setting our compass is having that orienting uh, drive in our lives, preferably one that combines both ourself and our drive to self-realize and others. And the more you can expand beyond me and mine and my immediate circle and you ripple out into work or your team and community and the planet, um, now you're really talking impact. So sometimes people struggle to like, what's my vision? I'm not sure. I don't even know what my why is or what my purpose is. So I- Elan, there's a question that I think is very related to what you're talking about. It's from Claudia. Perfect. How, how did you bring back your vision? I feel that I lost mine. Oh, Claudia, that's such a great question. I'm going to stop sharing for just a second, just so I can see all your faces. Hi there. Um, the truth is it never left. It never left. And that's why I talk about that inner GPS system, because when I'm busy making plans, I can't connect to it as clearly. But where society and all of the kind of inputs that we get around us are very loud. The economic drive is so loud. We got to pay your bills. You got to plan for retirement. You got to take care of your kids. You got, I mean, it's noisy. And so it's really easy to believe that that's where our energy, like who's got time for anything else, right? I'm just trying to like pay some bills and take care of life over here. And that feels like living life. Um, so taking that time to slow down, um, and I'll share some, a resource with you at the end where you could just do some reflective exercises to get back to it. Because what I found is when I look back, it was there all the, all the way along. And it's like, it's like a red thread. You just see glimpses of it every once in a while. And you're like, oh, that's the thing. And every time it comes back, it feels like a new idea. But it isn't. I'll go back to something I wrote. And it's like, I wrote that 10 years ago. And I'm only fulfilling it now. <laughs> So you got to create space. You got to create the container for that, for that voice of your vision to come through. Cause it's not going to beat you over the head the way things out there do. As I believe it's a statement from Chris. I feel the authentic self picture confirms what I have just been thinking earlier this evening. Do you want to say more about that, Chris? Um, not really, to be honest, because I'm still trying to, uh, put it together. Perfect. Figure it out. Perfect. Thank you. That's perfect. Well, thank you for sharing that. And, and sometimes just being with the question. That's the other thing is that, again, we move at a fast pace. And I, Roger, you made a comment earlier about something being one of the gifts of coronavirus. This is one for me. Um, I forget his name, Aaron. Uh, I think it was Aaron who I saw on screen. And I just saw the the top of a little child's head, uh, time to slow down because where are you gonna go? Like I did a puzzle this year for the first time in about 20 years, you know? So the gift of being able to slow down even though it's uncomfortable because of what's causing the slowdown, um, but just creating space to be able to hear that inner guidance and to process. It doesn't have to come with quick answers and solutions, so awesome. There are no further questions. All right, well, let's rock and roll then. You were born to it. <laughs> okay, so here's where I want you to do something interactive. What's the impact you're here to make? And I want you to stretch yourself and you don't have to share this out loud, it's just for you. What's the impact you're here to make? You heard maybe it sounded quite audacious when I said I'm here to up level 10,000 liters. When that number first came to me, it was about two years ago, that seemed like, like, woof, almost bigger 
than something I could actually do. And I specifically chose a number of people whose lives I wanted to touch rather than a monetary amount. And then I sat in a session this weekend where I went into the session coming from scarcity in a very small context. And I caught myself as a, as a coach. Sometimes I have to coach myself. <laughs> I caught myself and I shifted my context to be like, wait, if I'm just about the money that's in my bank account today, I can see the whole budget mentality and the whole scarcity mentality. But if I'm about building something today that can scale to serving 10,000, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of leaders, I need to make decisions about technology that I implement today that lines me up for that. So what's the impact you're here to make? Think bigger and broader if you can. And then I, I think this next one might need explaining. How would you get up to creating that impact today without your story? So when you write your impact, just get quiet and notice what happens. And for a lot of us, the very next thing that comes after we have the idea of what our impact is, is the gremlins being like, oh, but who are you to do that? And where would you get the money for that? What's my spouse gonna say, right? So all of those, and I call them stories because we have taken on narratives that things aren't possible, that I've learned when I go back and look at that narrative and start to peel away, that it was something I made up as an interpretation. It's not always true. Question from Ed, what if visions can't happen? Should we come up with new ones? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's an interesting, you know, an example might be like you thought you wanted to be an astronaut and now you're at an age where they wouldn't accept you into the program or uh, the, the word can't, I'm not always sure if that's a real thing or a tangible thing. Um, what I would say is sometimes what we say is our vision is we have gotten attached to a how as opposed to an impact. And may, uh, Chris, uh, Ed, would you be willing to give an example if it's not too personal? It's totally up to you. I don't want to put you on the spot. I, I don't know, but I feel, I feel that you, you mentioned something about your past and uh, you had you struggled a lot of, of things and you you probably uh, faced them and came across them and now you are uh, you are in a different level now yeah so uh, probably um this is what i was thinking about like right. these stages maybe a person is not in a stage that perfect can actually, yes uh, doesn't mind that so. yes that's gr i'm so glad you asked that and you know what when I look back and sure, there were things where it's like, um, if I had attempted to do what I'm doing today, let's say 20 years ago, I was a different person. I had a different perspective on the world. I had a different worldview. I had different resources. Um, would I have been successful? I don't know. And that's the thing you never know. But what I know for sure is when I look at what's happening now, and the shift that's happening now, there is not that there isn't fear. I still get up in the mornings and be like, whew, you know, this last night I kept having dreams about driving really fast. I am a fast driver, but I kept having dreams that I would, you know, get caught by the driver in front of me stopping short. And I'm like, you know, normally I'm a very fast but safe driver. And that felt risky to me. And I just realized that was a symbol of like how my life feels right now, because I am going for it with my business. I am all in. And I am making decisions based on the vision and fulfilling that vision and not letting the fear still comes up. I'm just not letting it drive the bus. So it's hard to know, would I have been ready back then? But the thing that has shifted is my willingness to step past the self-doubt and the fear and to do it anyways, and to lean into other resources. You know, I'm not doing it alone. I hired a mentor who's amazing um, at just the right time. That's why I say I never regret any of those experiences from the past. They've all led to this. Question from Jessica. Can you recommend how to determine what your vision really is if you aren't feeling one? Yeah, again, the word vision can, can kind of trip us up. 
Um, and it gets mixed up with purpose and, you know, our why and, and all of that. I don't know. I mean, I, I am happy to do, a, you know, a 30 minute conversation with anybody for me. I, and I can't tell you, it would just be a matter of asking you questions and discovering. And sometimes it's so subtle. It's the thing that's been there, like chipping away at you and you, you're not wanting to hear it. Other times, it's the thing that you are so naturally good at. And you had no idea that that could be something that you could not, doesn't have to be the, the, the way that you make your living, but you're so good at it. And it's so right here, you're like the fish in water. You can't even see it. Right. So sometimes it helps to have an outside perspective. What I would say was that, that was Jessica. Yes. Correct. Yeah. What I would say is talk to three to five people in your life and ask them what they see. What, what's the thing that, that stands out about me for you? And if you had to say something about what you think I'm here to do in this lifetime, what do you think it is? And just ask five people and see if there's any commonalities that show up from those five people. No further questions. All right, this is fun. Thanks for engaging everyone. Okay, so we've written down a little bit about the impact that we're here to make and what would you get up to creating or how would you get up to creating that impact today without your story? If you didn't let your story of the past or the worries about the future get in the way. We've already talked about this question, what's your one thing and my homework for you is to, if you haven't already, to look again and look again through the eyes of, you know, if this was the last 12 months that I really had to do the things that are important to me, would, would, what would it be? What would come to the top? Okay, now here's where the juice is. How are, okay, we're doing good for time. So how are you going to live that commitment into existence? And this is the way that I take that whole thing of power and love and people are like, well, that's not very tangible. What do I do with that? And you bring it down to like, something that you can live into as your orienting guide. And what I use is values. And so sometimes when we ask about values, we say things like, oh, integrity and authenticity and, you know, joy and service, being of service. And I'm like, great. What does it look like walking? Tell me and not me personally, tell yourself, but maybe you want to write down um, and I'm going to share a, a link with you. Roger will share a link with you. And in there, there's a link to do a values assessment so you can get your top values. And then from those top values, if you're willing to play the game, especially in service to your commitment over the next 12 months, write out for yourself, what do these values look like in action? And why is that important? Because life is going to keep lifing. So you're going to be like, I'm all about integrity. And then life is going to come and smack you upside the head. <laughs> and where's integrity at that moment? Well, you're hot. You're like, you know, why did you do that? And, da -da -da -da. and it's like, well, you said you were going to do this and you didn't keep your word. And then you get all defensive. So when those instincts kick in, it's easy to go back to the, whatever dynamic we have in our various relationships. And remember everybody being under stress and strain everybody feeling, having a different experience of yourself. I, I love those who had their 12 month fulfillment as being positive. I loved that because so many people right now can't find their way to hope. And you might be it for that person in your life. So how are you going to live that commitment into existence? What I'd love for you to do is write out your top three values if you know them. If not, in that guide I'll share, Roger will share with you, there'll be a link and you can find your top three values and then go one step further as to what that value looks like in action. If I was walking by you, how would I see integrity? If I was sitting down with you for a cup of tea, what would authenticity look like? Okay, so is anyone willing to play? Is anyone willing to throw out a value that maybe you have already top of mind? And we can just play the game of, well, what would that look like in action? Well, and I've just uh, shared four links. Which is the one that 
you would like people to the, the one that ends in 2020 oh. that is a guide and so let me just set that up for you what that is is a guide uh that i created it's a little bit feminine looking i use it with my female clients but it works for everybody it matches simon's shirt so you know <laughs> So go to the guide and if you wanted to actually start to, you know, again, not write a strategic plan, um, but to just be able to sort of surface and then keep front of mind some of the things that you're committing to, um, that guide will help you do it. And then uh, I wish I knew what page it was on. It's close to the front. But it, anyways, it's about your core values or your top values is the headline. And on that page, there is a link to go do a values assessment. Oh, the 2020 link doesn't work. Uh, okay. Um, I won't, I'll, I'm just, why don't I do this? I'll, I'll wrap up and then quickly in the background, <laughs> I will go and fix the link and make sure that you can all get access to it. We can always put the link in the video description. Oh, perfect. Yes. That means you can stay present with us. Okay. And would, okay. Excellent. That would be, that would be better. Okay. So was there a question that I missed or didn't fully answer? I feel like I didn't fully answer. There's a new question answer. from Raul. How important or not has been the participation or input of a close partner in your journey? Oh, <laughs> great question. Um, I don't know if others are experiencing this. By the way, in my journey, I had been alone for, I don't know, 15, 17 years. Uh, just started a relationship two years ago. So when that first layoff happened and, and my... The roller coaster was at the bottom in the trough. Uh, someone came into my life for the first time in 15, 15 years. I wasn't going to be like, okay, no, this isn't what I wanted because I declared I wanted that relationship. So then the honeymoon phase was over pretty quick because there's me in this roller coaster, right? So I would say it added layers of complexity and challenge. And one of the things I didn't share with you, but it is the way my values show up for me. And my mantra is relationships first. So I am committed to like, no matter what's going on, no matter how messy it gets, put the relationship first. That means I own my stuff and don't put it on the other person. I ask them to own their stuff and set healthy boundaries on that. Um, I feel like it's been important because I have somebody who believes in me. But at the same time, it also felt like a lot of pressure to get my act together. Because here was somebody who didn't really know me very well. And their only experience of me had been this like. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's a very, that was my very personal situation for you all. It might be different. But what I am aware of is right now in, with all that's happening, politics, race, health crisis, economic, you know, uncertainty. And for a lot of us, those are things that we don't even necessarily talk about or they can cause conflict in our relationships. And yet now we're dealing with all of it at the same time. So I would really encourage you to lean into community um, and really have that additional support so that you can navigate your way through that. Thanks for the question. Thanks, Melissa. We're going to deal with the, uh, my apologies. Uh, we will deal with the link after though. Roger will hook us up. All right, any other questions? Okay, I was asking if somebody wanted to share a value and we could try on what does that value look like in action? Who's brave? If somebody has courage as a value, this would be a great time to step forward. <laughs> David, hi. Uh, uh, I don't know if this fits exactly with what you are uh, asking for, but one of the things that I value greatly is uh, provoking uh, laughter. Like I, mm. I, as a caregiver and as someone who has worked with sick people, when they're smiling, when they're laughing, uh, uh, I know they're enjoying life. So that's yes. been uh, something that's driven me. And I have to remind myself to do that for myself when, yes. I, when I have my own issues or my own darkness comes into my head I go okay start dancing buddy start doing something because right so exactly but. and David you brought up such an important point it's like okay so our values are nice and we can describe what they look like in action 
And then what I do with my coaching clients often is I say, so what about when you're not able to live that value? Mm-hmm. Right. You're like, well, okay, I'm in this situation, I can't because we're too serious or yeah. this isn't the right environment or what have you. So just start to examine those areas where you've told yourself that it's not appropriate or that you can't, or it's not the right environment or the right dynamic. And then just go a little bit further, challenge yourself to be like, okay, well, how would, how would I express this? Like, why does this value even matter? Right. Bringing laughter, especially now bringing that levity people so need it. Right. So if there's ever a time where you put yourself back in a box and you think, well, not here, not now, like what's the impact? What's the cost of people not getting to experience that? Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I hope no one's offended by this, but um, a lot, many religions, including both Judaism and Christianity, are really about putting values into action. Mm. Awesome. Yeah. Isn't it funny that, you know, this is another practice for us, right? We all, I, I, I might have mentioned it, but this is something I'm practicing right now is not having beliefs become so cemented that it means I can't see the other human being, right? So Chris, you were like, you had to put this little disclaimer beside it. I hope nobody's offended by it. Well, it's like, hey, what you're contributing is lifting everybody up here, (laughs) right? And that's a practice for us. And I think that's how we'll start to bridge some of the divide that we're living in right now. Simon, hi. Hi, again. Um, so I think one of the values, uh, this is what I was thinking about right now is to be, to, to always be humble, mm. um, to keep myself humble, I would say, um, because at times, you know, especially when, when you are, I think you experience the same thing when you are, when you're a personal development coach or when you're some sort of a coach or you're a consult, you know, it, it kind of like boosts that ego up sometimes, you know, just people look up to you and all that. So yeah. I don't know, it's sometimes it's hard to be. To, to keep yourself humble and just just say well i need to listen more yes and then to, to understand more you know yeah and to catch yourself that's where the power love you know if you imagine it almost as two scales balancing out because yeah, I, like I i was raised you know i don't consider myself religious but i was raised in a very religious household and uh humble in our household was like martyrdom you were like, take yourself to the very back. Don't, you know, don't lift your head up. Don't be showy. Don't like, who do you think you are? Uh, but to the point where that diminishes the impact I'm here to have, right? I, we talked, I did a podcast earlier today where I was talking about like being uncomfortable, being visible. Well, you can't up level 10,000 liters or 100,000 liters if you can't be seen or if you don't want to be seen, right? So finding that right balance. And what I hear in what you do, Simon, and I can relate to is you are putting yourself out there in service to others. That's the very dynamic of don't diminish yourself. You have a right to self-realize and you're using it in service to so many other people who then they are more supported to self-realize and lift others up. So it's a chain reaction. Absolutely. Can't agree more. Yeah. Awesome. Ed. Elaine, a little time check. You've got uh, yes, seven, I know. seven it's minutes. It's just getting juicy. you got seven <laughs> minutes to go. Oh, seven minutes. Okay. Yep. Seven minutes to go. All right. uh, Hi, started a few minutes late. Okay. Yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, just like I wanted to uh, something very interesting, which is calling about talking about caring about each other, a trait, or uh, I don't know what it's called that you call it, but it's about caring about each other. Hmm. When, when actually it's very interesting because you said like, you don't want to care about other people a lot and forget yourself at the same time. Mm. At the expense of. At the expense of. Yeah. Exactly. So, so there is a way that I can run around being of service and that, that fits a need for me. Like I, I need to be needed. And so I can run around being of service, but it's not coming from a place of wholeness. It's coming from a place of something feels like it's missing and I need to fill it by taking care of other people. And then on the back end, you get resentment, you get, well, nobody ever takes care of me or what I experienced, you know, 10 years back was nobody knew how to take care of me because I looked so strong and invulnerable 
that nobody ever came to help me with anything. The same mentor that I had this weekend said, how much of your time do you spend being supportive? And how much do you spend being supportable? And we were all like, oh, hey. <laughs> Right. So it's it's getting that balance and and just knowing that if you haven't filled your own cup. Uh, Ed, do you have kids? No. Oh, OK. Well, that that's the thing that really drove it home for me is you only have so much to give. And if you don't fill your own cup and that thing is empty and you, you're running around trying to give to others, uh, it's it's a recipe for dis-ease and and unwellness. So um, it really is that balance. Thank you. Thank you. I thought I saw one more hand going once, going twice. No more questions. All right. I really apologize for the link. I worked extra hard on that to make sure it was working just fine. I tested it a couple of times, uh, but I'll get it sorted uh, as soon as we hang up here and get it over to, to Roger. I, I've just realized that uh, whenever I send a message to everyone uh, uh, accompanied by the link to your video, that everyone will get the link to the 2020. <clears throat> so we can get it out to everyone tonight. Okay, yeah, because the link won't change. It's just something that I did with the, the technology. So yeah, what it is, is a, it's a PDF that you can download and it just, it gives you, if you wanna take this work on of getting clear about what your commitments are. Look, many of you I'm sure use Google Calendar and task managers and project managers. You can keep the strategic planning stuff here. And then in the guide, it's really about getting quiet, listening to that inner guidance system and getting honest. There's some other workbooks in there that are more about like relational dynamics. I do a whole thing around power and love and how to actually use that to restore uh, relationships, whether it's your, you know, your boss or someone you're leading. Um, so that that's in there and some of it is self-explanatory. Um, and that's it. I think Roger has shared my contact information if you want to be in touch. Simon, I'm holding you accountable. You and I are going to connect. And there was a few people that are on I'll my 140. Yeah, there's a few people that are on my 143 list for tonight. Don't forget 143. Do you want to remind us what 143 was, Roger? Well, 143 was what you chose as the uh, networking tip. But, but close the loop for us. What actually does 143 mean? Uh, Simon, do you, okay, so 143 in tonight's context was uh, follow up. We're going to follow up, right? Yes. Simon, though, shared something with me about what it, what else it means. Thank, uh, well, it just uh, reminded me of Fred Rogers, um, who just said, uh, he used number 143, and people ask him what it means. He said, like, it just means I love you, because 143 is just the number of the letters. I love you you so that was very interesting when you said 143 i was like oh fred roger oh that's interesting <laughs> <laughs> perfect note to end on yeah awesome elan do you have some closing comments uh yeah i i've already i think i've already issued my challenge to you and it's a challenge with love and just to say don't let your song go unsung if there is something that's there in the background that you have been thinking about or maybe not sure about. And there's just any way that you can free up some of the time that might be going to Netflix or other things and put it, it into something that will have an impact for maybe people you know and maybe people around the world that you don't, will never meet. Um, I encourage you to take this moment in our history and channel that into something that uh, is about your impact in the world. Well, those are very fine words to conclude with uh, and a sentiment that I hope that everyone in our audience takes to heart and does it take action. Elan, on behalf of VBN, all our guests, all our members, our visitors, thank you so much for sharing these uh, words of wisdom. Uh, they are profound. I know they come from a place of deep love and respect, and I thank you for sharing them with us. Thank you. Thank you, Roger, for having me and for this amazing community of welcoming me and making me feel so at home here and for sharing yourselves. Great. Audience, 
Thank you so much for giving us your Tuesday evening. Uh, the time and the trust that you've uh, demonstrated by sharing it with us is very, very much appreciated. And I say that on behalf of both Alain and myself. Good night, you all. Uh, hopefully we'll see most of you Thursday morning for uh, Bert's talk uh, or next Tuesday evening, if that can't be. Good night. Thank you so much for joining us. Roger, you Roger. Thank you. Thank you. Morning. I beg your pardon. Is that sounded like a shock? Yeah, you sent the link for Thursday morning. It's uh, it, it's it's one of the events in the VBN. Um, uh, one of the uh, it's it's on VBN as a as a few upcoming event. Okay. Thanks, Ashok. Good night, you all. Yeah.